Now, my first occasion, I think most of you know, I went out on the work in 1963. Mr. Wark wrote me a letter, and he says, Ask the brethren for a letter for the Lord's work and come with me. <laughs> so I did. I had been exercised for about seven or eight years to go out, and so he took me with him. But he didn't take me to West Virginia. He took me around to Iowa and Wisconsin. And I didn't realize it at the time. But you know what he was really doing? He was getting me acquainted with the assemblies. That's what he was doing. And of course, he took me a new, to a new place in Cresco. We put a, a tent up in, a, in Cresco, Iowa, uh, about uh, 70 miles from the nearest assembly. And we had meetings there. And from Cresco, I ended up in West Virginia in a feed mill store when we closed those meetings. Two weeks later, I was preaching in a feed mill store near Romney. Well, then I went from there down into southern Ohio and, as the Irish would say, footed around for a few years down in southern Ohio. But then what set my heart on West Virginia, my wife I was raised in West Virginia until she was 13. In 1970, there was a man... There was a man in an assembly up in Frostburg, Maryland, which was across the line and about 35 mile up the line from the Potomac River that divided West Virginia from Maryland. And he says, Bob, you ought to go down to Kaiser. There was about 10,000 people there then. There's about maybe 13,000 there now. This is in uh, 1969. He says, you know, they're friendly. I've been going door to door. Now, this man, he, he couldn't warm the heart of a mosquito if he got up to preach. That's the kind of man he was. He wasn't a platform man. But you see, God uses men that aren't platform men too. And so uh, God used him as an instrument. And he had been going around Kaiser for months, knocking on doors and handing gospel papers out. And he says, you know, they're friendly down there. They're friendly down there. You ought to go. And uh, that was at the Frostburg Conference in May. And so that was in my mind for almost a year. And the next year, I got a hold of that uh, assembly and I says, you know, I'm going to go down there. And I want your prayers. And so we had two weeks of prayer meetings every night. Two weeks of prayer meetings. All day I'd be down there searching around and then uh, get back in time for a prayer meeting and give them a little shout for ten minutes at the end of the prayer meeting. And so the prayer meetings went on for two weeks. And finally, we got a lot in this little place called New Creek. We pitched the tent June the 21st and run an ad in the newspaper. And William Williams gave me some good advice. He gave me some good advice. He said, when you go into a town, there's two groups of people to get acquainted with and get their favor. First of all, the police. Get acquainted with the police department. And then get acquainted with the newspaper people. That's just what we did. I went and visited the police department, told them what I was up to. And I got acquainted with a newspaper. And uh, we weren't down there too long, and the newspaper said, would you write an article for us every week in the paper? And that's how we started to write the gospel tracts. And so uh, the only ones that objected to the article in the paper every week was the clergy. You've all heard of them. The cloth. The clergy. And uh, they went to the newspaper, some of them, and they said, how come you're printing this man's religious articles and he doesn't live in, even live in West Virginia? And you know what the newspaper told them? Because he's not lazy like you are and you won't write. So uh, that was all right. I was in with the newspaper. And I get in with the police department as well. Well, we put the tent up June 21st. And you know, the first night the thing was full. Over a hundred strangers. And you know, it was good timing. You know, God has a timing for everything. Because there'd been a scandal with two preachers in town. With women. And the whole town was upset. At the religious system. And here comes this fellow in. And they don't know who he is. But they hear he doesn't take money. And so they, they all came out. And they filled the tent. We went on for a, a fair amount. And I was all by myself. We, we went on for a fair amount of time. We went on for 11 weeks. Every night, except Saturday night, uh, preaching away. And you know, God came in. God came in. I remember that the first, uh, first ones were saved were the pancakes. Archie Stewart says he'd give them a good flipping over in the skillet. 
You know, you flip a pancake on both sides. But you know, they came, the Pancake Brothers and their wives. They had a dairy. They milked 52 cows at 4 o'clock in the morning and then pasteurized the milk and homogenized it and bottled it and delivered it. And it was a full day's work, but they just managed to get to the meeting every night in their white suits from the dairy just in time to get into the tent. And the thing was they had to sit up front every night because there's only a couple empty chairs and they were always in the front row. But you know, God came in and dealt with them. And I remember after maybe three weeks or two weeks, Larry and his wife went out and they couldn't shake my hand. I, well, I did sort of shake, you know, but they wouldn't look at me. And I says, God's got his hook in them. And so I went over there the next day just to drop by and say hello. And he come out on the porch all smiles. And I thought I had him figured wrong. He's not no, he's not concerned about his soul whatsoever. Uh, look at him smiling. Why he doesn't looks like he doesn't have a care in the world. And I thought he was uh, think, thinking about his soul. Come on in, he said. So we talked about the weather, and I said, now I want to ask the two of you something. What do you think of that? I got a two roads chart, a big oil painted one. Beauty. It's a good one. It was painted in West Virginia, too, about 55 years ago. It's an old one, but it's good. It's got a lot of flames over in the right-hand corner, the League of Fire. And they're, they look real good, too, and you put a, a quartz iodine light on them, I'll tell you. They light right up. And, you know, uh, I said, what do you think of that chart? What road do you think you're on? And, you know, they started to cry, the two of them. And they said, that's what we want to tell you. We got off the broad road last night. And we're saved. I says, you're saved. I said, we're saved. Now here's people that never heard the gospel in their life. Never. But they had a saved mother. And uh, she really never preached to them, you see. But she tried to live a Christian life. She was a Methodist woman. But at any rate, I said, how'd that happen? And here, this is unusual. Uh, I gave them Archie Stewart's tract, Eternal Life, the Gift of God. And they got home. And I preached that night on, Come unto me, all ye that labor. Depart from me, all ye cursed. And I contrasted the two. And uh, they went over the Bible and they read, they said, and he said, Mabel, let's get down on our knees and read this gospel tract. And they get down on their knees at the foot of the bed. And he read the tract out loud. And he come to that part where Mr. Stewart says, Eternal life is a gift and all you have to do is take it. And he looked at that. He says, Mabel, I'm going to take it. She says, well, I will too. And that's how simple it was. And they've lived to prove it. And God's given them 12 children. And he's delivered five of them himself. And that's something now. But at any rate, that was the first fruits at New Creek. A couple nights later, uh, his brother Robert and his wife they went out the door, and uh, Bob said to me, I was saved while you were preaching. And his wife says, well, I was too, but I wanted to tell the preacher first. And there they were, sitting in the meeting, both saved, and the other one didn't know the other one had gotten saved in the meeting. And so the meetings went on. You see, you couldn't quit with something like that going on. And the place packed out every night. And, you know, uh, it, it wasn't a big tent. I got a bigger tent now. It was a, it was a 28 by uh, 45. My tent now is uh, 40 by 60. And I thought my sound wasn't getting to the back. And I was just a hollering my lungs out. And, you know, in visiting, we visited all the homes within almost 10 miles of that tent every day, out for six hours, door to door, door to door. And I got up on Piney Swamp Road, one mile from the tent, up the mountain, you see. And you know, sound goes up. That's the only excuse I have. And this man says, I've been to your meetings every night. I says, I've never seen you yet. He says, I'll tell you what you preached on last night. I says, what? Zacchaeus. I said, someone told you. He says, no, sir. I was sitting listening to you last night. I says, where? He says, in my backyard. A mile away. And I was worrying my voice wasn't getting to the back of the tent. It used to be louder than it is now. But you see, sound goes uphill. That's the only excuse I have. And that man, he never got saved. He never come to the tent. But he said he heard me almost every night unless the wind was blowing the wrong way. And so we saw 19 profess. 
And then we thought, well, uh, we're going to stay. We're going to stick around here, you know. So I went home for three days just to say hello and come back. And you know, in those three days, those Baptists, the, Bap, the fundamental Baptists, had visited almost everybody that had come to that tent. They had spies in the meeting. And they're just waiting for me to leave to incorporate these people and get them to join their church, you see. But, and you know, it's, it's amusing. These people, they're, they're kind of witty, you know. Maybe that's where I get some of this. I don't know. My dad wasn't witty, even though he was Irish. A very sober kind of a person. But at any rate, they said to Larry Pancake, Hey, I hear your preachers left you. He says, yes, but he's like the Lord Jesus. He said, I will come again. And I was back in three days. And we got a little uh, town, uh, a little schoolhouse that hadn't been used for years in Laureldale. Now that would be about uh, eight mile, maybe nine, no, maybe ten mile up the road and up the valley uh, south of uh, New Creek. And it was up in the, the mountains and we cleared it out and we uh, got it all cleaned up and we started Bible readings. Bible readings. And about 65 came. There was about 125 coming to the tent, but when we started the Bible readings, it kind of dropped and got down to about 65 people. And every time we fired up the... It was getting cold by then. Every time we fired up the furnace, you know, all the wasps would come alive. And I had a lot of fun shooting those things with these squirt guns, you know. But we, every night, and the people came, and as we taught them the truths of God, they started to fall off. And we lost a lot of Pentecostal people when I told them what tongues really was. We lost a group there, and you know, after uh, 37 weeks, so I, well, 37 total, we had 25, 26 weeks of Bible readings every night, but Saturday, and uh, so I was only home three days, in a total of 37 weeks, after 37 weeks, uh, the brethren, uh, in, before that we had baptized them, you see, we baptized the ones that professed in the tent, and I'll tell you what I did, I brought some brethren a distance from an assembly, I said, I want you to quest them, I don't want to be doing this all on my own, I want this to be in fellowship with the assemblies, and we brought some brethren to question those people, you see, and they were convinced too that they had the life of God, and so we baptized them. And you know, uh, one one night, uh, the brethren said to me, we're going to break bread Lord's Day, would you like to join us? And see, we had taken them through uh, the epistle to the Romans, and we skipped the parenthetical part, you know. We skipped that part, 9, 10, and 11, we just skipped that. We didn't figure that would be profitable right then for young believers. And then we got into 1 Corinthians, and when we got up to chapter 11, uh, the next day they said, we're going to break bread, Lord's Day, will you join us? I said, what are you going to do that for? They said, that's what the Bible says. You were teaching us that the other night. And so they baked the bread, and they went and bought a bottle of wine, and uh, Lord's Day, uh, March the 21st, 1971, we uh, sat down with 13 believers. And you know, it was aluminum, it was a, it was a, a linoleum floor, and uh, Larry Pancake had the house. He had borrowed it from a doctor. The doctor says, will you live in this house for five years? It's all furnished. I've got to go to college to be a doctor. Just live in the house and uh, keep it going, and you can have the house free for five years. That's pretty reasonable rent, wasn't it now? And uh, so we sat down, and we broke bread. And I'll tell you, I never saw anything like it. They all wept. I just cried. I sat there, and you know, one man got up after the other. One right after the other. There was no waiting at all. No waiting at all. Maybe they thought they had to get up and turn, you see. But they all got up, and I never was in a meeting like it. It just touched my heart so much. And there they were. Then went over closer to New Creek to a place by the name of Burlington, and it was an airport that was closed, and so we put the tent up on the runway. And... Uh, <laughs> A plane landed one day, too, and he had some... He said, would you like a ride? He had one of these souped-up airplanes that uh, uh, flew up and up, uh, up and down the sides of the mountain looking for oak disease on the trees. He worked for the state. I said, sure, I used to fly. We just put the tent up. He said, I'll take you up. i got to go over here and get some coffee. 
But you know what he got? He got Irish coffee. Do you know what Irish coffee is? It's whiskey. And he come back in on, he really smelled bad, but he took me up and he t took the plane off downwind and went down the runway as fast as he could, wide open throttle, and kept it on the ground and the trees kept coming, getting closer and I'm getting, starting to get white knuckles and he just pulled the stick back. And the thing went up like that and almost stalled, but he gave me my airplane ride. But anyways, we preached there and of course, uh, we put an ad in the paper. And I got all the, the, the little children from the Christians that had been saved in New Creek. I got them to stand in line, and I give them a, all a, a hymn book. And uh, I stood at the door, hand them out, and I had a brother take a picture of this, you see. And then I put, put an ad in the paper. We spent a lot of money on ads. We felt that we should let the people know what's going on. And so we put an ad in the paper, preaching so clear that even they understand. Little children waiting in line. And you know, it's amazing. It was amazing. Because, because a preacher in that area had been going around telling everybody, don't go, he'll confuse you. And one woman told me that. She says, and he come to the house to tell her that. He says, why well, that man will confuse you if you go to hear him. She says, I want to tell you something. She said, he's cleared up a lot of things for me and you've been the one that's confused me. Well, that got him up in the air, and he began to work against me, and all of a sudden his dear mother, away up in northern Pennsylvania, took a stroke. He had to go up. That took him off the scene. While we were preaching in Burlington, there's a, a fellow by the name of uh, Fred uh, Trenton, and he said, would you come, would you come to Purgatsville? Come to Purgatsville and uh, preach the gospel. Well, I said, all right. Well, I said, where's it? down the road, isn't it? He says, yes, about 15 miles down the road up here on the way to Moorfield. He says, if you'd come, uh, there's, a, there's a church building there I think you could get, the Old Pine Church. It was owned by the Historical Society, a bunch of old ladies in that county owned it. And uh, it was built in 1692. It was all logs, but it had been covered over with clapboard. And there was no electricity in it. There's a graveyard, of course, in the back, the old pine church. And so we went to see the old ladies and just buttered them up a little bit, you know. And we got, we got the building. Well, another preacher down the road, he got stirred up. And he got a petition up. But he couldn't get too many names. But Fred Trenton got his dander up too. And he got 500 signatures. I said, now, Mr. Trent, you don't have to do that. I said, I, he says, the Lord whipped them in the temple with a scourge. He says, I have a right to fight for you. See, that's how West Virginia is if he likes you. And so we went down to see the congressman, mind you, down the road. And showed him all these signatures, 500 people. And that the historical society said it was all right. And so they gave us the old pine church. But the old lady says, you can't have electricity. You can't wire the place. So we just took some two by fours and made, put one here and one there and run this way. And we hung our fluorescent lights on them and run a cable out the back window and down the graveyard far enough so you couldn't hear the noisy power plant run. And we put it behind a big tombstone and fired up and traced away. People began to come. People began to come. And uh, that's Perkinsville. I'll tell you what I called it before it was all over with. But at any rate, uh, these people came and they, they had a side-loading wood stove and uh, the sawmill at New Creek, right across from where the hall is now, they said, take all the wood you want. If it's for the gospel, it's free. And so I loaded up the car and wouldn't you know it's full of roaches in the wood. And I'm throwing them in the side-loading furnace, and they're jumping out and running all over the floor. And I'm trying to stamp on them before the meeting and kill these crazy things. They're running all over the floor, but we got a good audience. And uh, I told this one man, I says, look, after the meeting starts, after we sing the second, when we're singing the second hymn, you go out and put another quart of gas in that uh, power plant because it won't last the hour. So he did. And one night, you know, I went overtime. I got all fired up. Do you ever see fluorescent lights slowly dim and then go out? They dimmed, just like they're on a real stand. Then the place was in darkness. But I had a flashlight. And I'll tell you how the West Virginian is. 
going out, I'll tell you what one woman said. Her sister was the personal secretary of Henry Kissinger when he was Secretary of State. I got an invitation to see visit him and Nixon with the family. But I said, I can't. I'm, I'm too busy preaching to go to Washington to visit President Nixon. I, maybe I should have gone. I, had, I could have had 15 minutes with the President of the United States through that woman. But at any rate, her sister going out, you know what she said? She says, too much gas in the pulpit and not enough in the power plant. <laughs> and that's how they are. And at that time, there were seven women professed. And three of those women went 27 miles over the mountain to be incorporated into the little New Creek Assembly. That's how we worked. About 15 years, we just worked in that area. One here, none here, two here, you know. And more than half of them saw the truth and were brought into the little assembly. During those meetings, there's a man by the name of Brook High related to Will Rogers. You've all heard of Will Rogers, the famous statesman. He was a, made some witty statements that have gone down in history, and Will Rogers was related to him, and he had a store in Purgettsville. Purgettsville consisted of two stores, and his store had never ever been painted, and the sides were bulging, so he took telephone poles and rooted them in the ground and stuck them up against the side walls because the roof was pushing the walls out. It, it was something else. And the, the floor was dirt, a dirt floor. And he had an old sign hanging out front, at the end of the road you meet God. And you know, he's quite a man. He had no refrigeration in the store. I asked him for salad dressing and he put mayonnaise on the counter. He blew the dust off. He'd get stuff off the shelf, <laughs> put it on the counter. I says, I want that stuff that's orange, French dressing. What's that? I says, it's colored orange, Brook. Never heard of the stuff. Imagine running a grocery store, and the only salad dressing he knew was mayonnaise. He says, if you ever find any of that newfangled stuff, he says, bring it in. I'd like to see what it looks like. That's a character. But you know, he had the fear of God, like most West Virginians. They might be rough, and they might have a sense of humor, but they do have the fear of God. It's one of the states in the United States that I feel it's easy to get people to hear you yet. And every time I'd walk in the store, he had a little radio, and he'd turn it off. And the men used to sit in there and chew the fat, and they could chew their tobacco too and spit on the floor because it was just dirt. And they'd sit there and spin yarns, you know. And uh, when I would walk in, he'd turn the radio off. He says, all right, men, quiet down. Preacher, don't pray for my business. Pray for my customers and pray for me. Every time I went in that store. Now, how often would you find a grocer in Vancouver tell everybody in the store to be quiet when you walked in so you could pray for them? So we would pray for them. And you know, he had two rolls of money, 20s, 50s, and $100 bills here, and ones and fives and tens here. And I said, Brooke, he didn't have a cash register. I said, you know, someday you're going to get robbed. And quick as a wink, he had a little ledge under the counter. He pulled his gun out at me. He says, you'll get this. And he would have. And I went to see him. He came to the old pine uh, meetings. I think we were there seven weeks. Always by ourselves, usually. And, of course, the preachers. They started talking. And they were fuming because this man came from Ohio and took all the money out of the community from them. Their churches weren't being supported because this outsider came and took their money away. And he says, I want to tell you boys something. He says, that man never took one red cent. I was at every one of his meetings up there in the old Pine Church. Well, he said, how does he live? Ah, he says, I know, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> oh, come on, Brooke, tell us. No, I ain't going to tell you. Brooke, please, how does that man get along? Well, all right, I'll give you, I'll tell you. He says, his daddy's a multimillionaire. He meant my father in heaven. That's the way he put it. 
And they spread it all around that I was just a playboy doing this for a hobby. That's what they got out of it. And I had gone to see him about putting a tent up. And Mr. Stewart, Archie Stewart, always told me, he says, get money in their hand. Get money in their hand. And so I thought, how am I going to approach Brooke about, there's only a lot just big enough for that little tent I had at the time. That's the only place in the whole valley. You see, you need a flat area. And this uh, area was just about the size of this hall, just big enough for my 25 by 45 tent. And uh, I'm thinking, how am I going to ask him this? He owns it. And he says, Preacher, do you have a tent? I said, yes. Why don't you put it up over there? I says, that's what I come to ask you. Well, get her up. I'll come a $20 bill. What's that? I says, that's for the lot. He says, you put that back in your pocket right now. He says, that's God's land. You're preaching God's word and I can't charge you. Isn't that a nice attitude? And most of the tents we've put up in West Virginia, we've never had to go see the city council and we've never hardly ever had to pay rent except off the C&O Railroad, they charge me $100. Of course, they don't have much money. That's the way it is, isn't it? The rich want more. But you know, we put the tent up, and that man, I think, got in a little soul trouble, never got saved. We took the tent down. But you know, some of the women that professed in the old pine church, that was in the winter, you see, and we we come along in the spring with a tent. Uh, one widow woman, her son, professed a real gem, and he's in the meeting too now in New Creek. But you know, dear Brooke, I went to see him about three months after that he took cancer. And he was in the Winchester Hospital. That's where Billy Graham's uh, wife was born, Winchester, Virginia. So I went all the way to see him, a whole day's journey. And I walked in and I says, Brooke, I said, you're not ready to meet God. He says, preacher, I'll make it. I says, how are you going to make it? He says, I've never heard a person in my life. And he says, I love you. And he says, I, I did all I could to help you and I'll make it. That's what he went into eternity with. In spite of me preaching to him, begging with him, weeping over him, he died in his sins. And so the gospel preacher bears precious seed, but sometimes he has to weep. When we uh, started to build the hall, uh, here's the attitude the brethren had. Now mind you, these brethren didn't have a lot, but here's the attitude they had that God should have a better dwelling place than they had. And so we started on the hall. You know, they were given all the money. I told them different preachers that were doing the work of the Lord as I felt should be done, and they were sending every penny out. And I said, you've got to start saving money uh, to build a hall. Do you know what they told me? A farmer never will get more uh, crops by keeping his seed in the barn. They said, we've got to sow the Lord's offering out, and we'll get more back. That was their attitude. So we started the hall with $1,000 to build the hall. That's all we had. And uh, they ordered the windows and well, hoped to get the money by then at uh, uh, the, the lumber yard. And Anderson gas-filled uh, uh, tube windows. They're really expensive. And uh, here, when the windows came, there was only two out of the eight, and they couldn't get the other six. I happened to be home at that time. I went home, and a man says, uh, why don't you talk to this brother in Akron? He does contracting work, so I phoned him up, and I said, brother, could you get those windows? He says, yes, I can. And he called the place, and they said, we've got nine of them left. And you know, when he went down the next day, someone had gone in there just after he called and scooped them all up. And so he called New York City, rush order for these six windows, and he brought them all the way down to New Creek. And you know, they only had $300 in the building fund. And uh, they said to the brother, uh, how much do we owe you for the windows? He says, give me $300. He didn't know that's all they had. So he got the windows. Then they went to buy the pillars, big sculptured. I says, you got to put a good nose on the building. And so they, we, went up to, uh, we went up to Pennsylvania and got, uh, got the... Uh, got the pillars, and here the office was cold, closed. They said, well, they picked them up on Pancake's big truck, 
and they said, go to the loading dock, they'll give you the bill. And the loading dock says, we don't have the bill, don't worry about it. And they had the check ready to give them. And here they found out they had made a mistake in their checking account and they didn't have enough for them anyways. But they brought the pillars home. And a month later, they got the bill and had the money by then for the pillars. And then the bricks had been delayed. And they had used some money that they intended to buy the bricks with. And they were building the hall. And all of a sudden, uh, about eight weeks too late, in comes the brick truck with the bricks. And the bill is $1,350. And that's to collect right there, you see, when they come in from Pennsylvania. Auto Brick Company. Well, do you know what happened that morning? That was uh, the week before the Gynavillo Assembly, uh, unknown to us, said we're going to take up a collection to help with the building of this hall. And do you know what it was? $1,350. And it came the same day as the brick company came an hour before. They had the money to pay for the brick. Now you see, uh, this isn't coincidence. All this strengthened their faith in God. And the hall went up, nice little hall. I think it's about 28 foot wide and 45 foot long with four big Grecian pillars up the front. And uh, it went up debt free, debt free. Didn't know a penny. And you know, the bankers in town, I found out nine miles down the road was Kaiser, you see. And the bankers in town, they're all wondering, where'd they get the money? Well, they never did find out, but the Lord provided. And I drew the plans. I never knew I was an architect. I drew the plans. I drew them on a, a, a brown shopping bag with a pencil. That's how we put the hall up. And there was no restrictions on wiring or anything. The only restriction was you had to have such a size septic tank. That was the only restriction. And it went all right until we went to put in the men's room and I had the stairway going right down in front of the, where the door was to go into the men's room. The stairway going down. The men's room was under the front porch. And then there was a window in the way where the door was supposed to be over here. And we had to make some adjustments. But we got the thing up anyways. And it's a nice little hall. But the hall was finished May the 5th, 1974. Then I moved out a hundred mile uh, away from there, west to Fairmont, West Virginia. And we saw some souls saved. And I worked in that area for about 12 years and had a following maybe of 65 people, but they were all old people. And we really didn't see that much. We saw young people profess, but they were all women. We saw one young man, the rest were all women. And some older folks professed. But I was afraid, I was really afraid to suggest even sitting down to break bread with a bunch of old people that loved me and would have done anything for me. I thought, no, they've got to see more than that. And we were, we were there nine weeks. Nine weeks. And you know, I was really touched. They found out my birthday was September 2nd. And we were closing up the meetings. They weren't quite closed. And this man had a cement mixing business. Had big cement trucks and everything. And he had a, a trailer park. And he had a big ranch home in the middle of the trailer park. His name was Edgar High School. And he said, could you and your wife... My wife came down for the last couple weeks. He says, can you come over? We, we'd uh, uh, like to ask you some things. So we went over. And there was, there was about 45 people in the house. And they started to sing happy birthday to you. They had a birthday party for me. Big bowl of punch and cake. Now here's people nine weeks before I'd never known. Never known them. Then I was really touched. When they said, you've brought the gospel to us. We've never heard the gospel like this in our life. We've heard gospel, but not like this. You see, they don't hear plain preaching. And they had gifts for me and my wife. And they said, brother, this is not money. You said you wouldn't take money for the gospel, so this isn't for the gospel. This is a gift. And you made a remark in the meeting one night to about God's salvation that if you refused a gift, it was an insult. And so these are gifts. They had me. You know, some of those envelopes had $100 bills in them. And those people didn't even know me nine weeks before. And they loaded us up with socks and shirts and ties, and they gave my wife things. And you know, they said, we want you to give us a speech. Do you know what I did? I stood there and I started to cry. For once I was speechless. Speechless. We did go down to the middle of the state, a place called Birch River. 
And of course, we couldn't break bread there, and it was a rough place. And some man, a big, rough, ungodly man, a wink settler, uh, he was in, uh, I think, you know, I think he sold dope on the side, and he had a beer joint and a, a den. It was a, it was, it was called a rebel shelter. So you know what kind of place it was. And this is back in the mountains. But he took a liking to me. Big man, and never wore any clothes except bib overalls. No shirt. All hair and a beard, and really rough. And he tried to give me a bunch of money one day, and I said, I don't want your money. Uh, oh, he says, you're going to take it. I says, I don't want your money, Wink. He threw it down. I says, the birds can take it away. I'm not touching it. So then he picked it up, and you know, he couldn't figure me out. He says, what can I do for you? I says, come to the meeting. Well, he came the last night, and you know what he did when he walked in? He stopped the meeting. It was about two-thirds through, and he says, preacher, this woman's man just died. Pray for her. This woman had just lost her husband. He and she come running to Wink's uh, beer joint. She says, my man's dead in the house. He says, come with me. And he brought, left the man lying a corpse in the house and brought her to the tent. <laughs> and, and so we closed the meeting and I talked to her and I tried to comfort her. And she's a bit of a simple woman. And you know what she said to me? I said, well, you know, maybe your husband was saved. And if he was saved, he's in heaven. She says, that's the trouble, she says. He's in hell. He died a sinner. Imagine a woman telling you that. He's in hell. That touched me. And that woman, as far as I know, never was reached and saved. A number of years later, I went back to that area. We didn't see anybody professing those meetings. We went back and Wink says, why don't you put your tent up here again? I says, well, that lot, the coal mines put an office there. He says, well, do you know any other lots? I says, there's one at the corner of the main, uh, the highway and the road going into Birch River has, was leveled off by bulldozers years ago and they're trying to grow hay on it. But I says, I can't get it. He says, call me back in a week. Do you know what he did? He called me in a week. I called him. He says, bring the tent down. We got the lot. So we brought the tent down and took the fence down, and we put the tent up while the owner was standing there cursing and swearing. He was as mad as a hatter. He didn't want the tent up on his own property. But you see, Wink sort of persuaded him. He's a rough, huh, Ty? He's a rough boy. Packed a gun and everything. But he liked me, you see. So I got in. And wouldn't you know it, his wife professed to get saved. The dear man's wife. He's not saved yet. The last I saw him, he'd been shot. They waylaid him. They waylaid him. They burned his place down. The state highway patrol and the sheriff had his place burned to the ground. And he found out, and he got the sheriff put in jail for three years. And when the sheriff got out, he laid wait for him and filled him with ten bullet holes. He showed me every one. He had a bag here. They got his intestines and they shot up his legs and everything, but they didn't kill him. And you know, when they got him on the ground, they put the, the rifle in his mouth, pushed it through his, knocked all his teeth out, pushed the rifle in his mouth and pulled the trigger and it didn't go off. And then they were on. I says, where would you have been? He says, I'd have been in hell. Not saved yet. Last year, uh, we went into Whitmer. Well, it was the year before, uh, last year. We went into Whitmer a year ago last September and found a little schoolhouse. And they wanted to give it to me, but we got a hundred dollars into the fire department's hands. They had leased the building. And so we preached there. And we were only there three weeks, but we made a lot of friends in little Whitmer. Whitmer's just 20 miles from Spruce Knob, the highest point in the state. And it's nine miles back off the road. And then it's just dirt road, 25 miles up to Spruce Knob. It's sort of a dead-end thing, and there's 70 homes there. And uh, it was a lumbering camp at one time, a real rough place. But it's kind of got uh, civilized, and uh, the lumbering's out of there now, and the mill is, there's no more mill. And there's just uh, one general store, there's no gas station, there's a post office about the size of this platform up here, with a woman sitting in it, and uh, some boxes on the wall, and that's where all the women congregate in the morning. That's where I would go down in the morning and, and give them an all an exhortation to come to the meetings. But you know, it's amusing. I hadn't been there three nights, and this fellow walked in with all this television equipment to put me on live, television live. And <laughs> 
It was something else. And then I had to watch it at 10 o'clock that night. He says, I want you to see the rerun on this. And you know, when I saw myself on TV, I said to him, I could say like Cain, my punishment's greater than I can bear. Turn the thing off. I couldn't stand to see myself up there jumping around. He says, I never thought I'd jump around so much. But we made friends. We made friends. Nobody professed. So this summer, down we went again. And you know, I got Roy Weber down there for three weeks out of the five, and uh, uh, we were going to put the tent up in the morning, and this brother, this energetic brother from New Creek, he drove over the mountains about an hour and a half drive, says, let's put her up now. I says, you're crazy, man. It's dark. 40 by 60 tent. A bear ring. You know, it's like a circus tent. You put the poles up first, and then you lace the roof together, and you crank it up with a winch, the, the roof. No, we can get it up. So we got a couple of men from town, and by the light of the moon, we put the tent up. In moonlight. That's the first time ever it was moonlighting. But at any rate, we got the tent up. And you know, we didn't get crowds like we thought, but we got about, our biggest night was 45. But those 45 were total strangers. Total strangers. We have, we got a 32 foot trailer we pulled with a suburban, and I lived in that. And we put the thing up in this brother, this brother's yard. He'd only been saved four years. Man in the seventies, Hermie Tingler, nice fellow, big fellow, two hundred sixty-five pound man. And uh, his wife's a workaholic, a real skinny thing. And they're up at five thirty in the morning, working around, fiddling around. Then they go to bed around nine thirty, ten o'clock. But at any rate, uh, we got some people to come in, and we saw one profess. That's all. But one's more worth more than a whole soul. But you see. We've made more friends. We've made more friends in that area. It's only a, a place of 70 homes. That's all there is. And we worked the whole valley, and we worked Harmon as a little bigger town. But our name is getting known in that area now, you see. So we'd like to go back maybe later on this winter and revisit them and keep at them. And maybe, hopefully, maybe we might see something formed. I don't know. Remember West Virginia. You know, the United States has 50 states. Would you believe that there's 33 states where there's no laborers and no testimonies? That's two-thirds of our country, south of you folks. Two-thirds of our country have no men from gospel halls entering into those states and preaching the gospel. Well, might God raise up men. I know it's the last days, but I still think there's work to be done. Ere the Lord comes, might God exercise men to launch out and preach, not where Christ has already been named. Shall we pray?